All right, so uh, hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first to tell you who you have the opportunity of conversing with. So uh, I'm Chavatior Samuelson. I'm a Regents Professor of History and Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism. And I'm also the Director of Jewish Studies at the Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. I was actually born in Kibbutz Afikim in Israel, and uh, I have been trained by the Hebrew University. So um, my uh, PhD is from the Hebrew University, and my first book uh, on the uh, life and thought of Rabbi uh, David Judah Ben Mr. Leon received the award of the Hebrew University um, for the best work in 1991. So I've been at Arizona State University uh, since uh, 1999, and um, I've been uh, engaged in a variety of, uh, <coughs> of themes that are relevant to the talk today. So in uh, 202, you have this book, Judaism and Ecology. Judaism and Ecology was uh, based on the conference on uh, Judaism and the natural world. Uh, it was part of a series on uh, religion and e world religions and ecology. And I was asked to edit the book of the conference and that was my entry into the conversation. So this book is from 202. This book, Religion and Environment, The Case of Judaism, is the book that was published last year and it's based on a series of lectures that I gave in 2016. And between those two covers, you can see the differences of the approach. In this book, you have the word, you can see the word Baruch. This actually comes from an illuminated manuscript from the 14th century. And it gives you a sense of uh, how nature is important in Jewish textual understanding. This book, you all recognize that, um, that picture that comes from the tip, the southern tip of the Kinneret. Kibbutz of Hikim, of course, is south of here, so you can't really see it. Uh, but this is where I grew up when, and actually here the point is how Zionism, uh, there's a lot to be said about Zionism, mis a kind of reinterpretation and, and reconfiguration of many uh, religious themes. So between those two books, one in 202 and one in 220, I've written various essays in, ver in uh, volumes, such as Encyclopedia of Religion and Nature or Oxford Handbook of Religion and Ecology, Encyclopedia of Religion and Science, Rutledge Handbook of Religion and Ecology. These are the books that constitute the uh, academic field of religion and ecology. And I very much participated in that, participate in that field, and I kind of bring the, the Jewish uh, voice to this uh, conversation. So the structure of my presentation uh, will be, I'll say a little bit more, I'll start from the left, right? I'll try to say a little bit more about the complexity of defining Jewish environmentalism. I will also, in the middle part of the talk, I will speak about religious principles of Jewish environmentalism. And in the last part of the talk, I will, talk, I will give, give some information on Jewish environmental activism. Most of my focus is gonna be on the United States, but I will say a little bit about some organizations uh, in Israel. So to, to start, we're gonna spend some time thinking about the complexity of understanding religious environmentalism. Another way to talk about religious environmentalism is to use the word environmental spirituality. Uh, and that's of course an ambiguous term. What I have on, this, on the uh, slide here, this is a very important person in this conversation. His name is Roger Gottlieb. Uh, and uh, he teaches in uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and I would like to start with his definition of what is spirituality. It comes from his book, Spirituality, What It Is and Why It Matters. And he teaches us the following, as you can see on the slide, spirituality is an understanding of how life should be lived and an attempt to live that life. A spiritually oriented life gives rise to certain characteristic experiences 
and certain characteristic experiences may prompt the adoption of spiritual perspective and motivate a spiritually oriented life. So that's a very broad uh, kind, uh, kind of definition. Uh, he suggests that spirituality emerges primarily in moments of crisis, such as illness, it, it, addiction, uh, disability issues, oppression, discrimination, poverty, existential malaise, or awareness of uh, pending death. In other words, there's no human life really that does not pertain or that does not involve a reference to the spiritual dimension. And since spirituality pertains to our mental, social, and political life, spirituality is not limited just to religious rituals such as praying or Torah study, but spirituality engages a lot of activities, can be anywhere from uh, practicing yoga, meditation, spending time in Vipassana retreats, but also taking care of the environment. So I give you here uh, some of his books just to uh, entice you and suggest that you go and look at the work of Roger Gottlieb. So he has a book on spirituality of resistance. He actually came from the kind of the Marxist left and over the years, this is his most recent book, Morality and the Environmental Crisis. And in, in between, you have two books which are very important to the uh, discipline of religion and ecology. So Roger Gottlieb is an example of a Jewish uh, environmental activist as well as thinker. And I will come back to him and other people in a minute. So let me uh, suggest to you that religious uh, environmentalism or environmental spirituality, even though it may seem to you a contradiction in terms, it's actually not contradictory uh, at all. Uh, the idea here that the way we relate to the environment always is framed by the culture. And for Judaism, that means culture of religious texts, religious values, religious norms, and so forth. So the outlook of Jewish environmentalism consists of various claims, for example, uh, that uh, Jewish, that human beings are part of the natural world, that nature has a moral standing, and human beings have moral obligations toward nature, uh, and that in order to fulfill our moral obligations, human beings experience self-transcendence that enables them to feel closer to God. So. There's no contradiction between being engaged in environmental activism and work on, you know, uh, in favor of protecting the environment uh, then, and, and, and engaging, in Jewish, uh, engaging in Jewish life. Um, religious environmentalism endows life with meaning. It encompasses our cognitive and emotional life, and it guides our social and political action and enables us to take action concerning uh, concrete challenges such as climate change. So if you look at this slide and you see kind of how do I uh, define Jewish environmentalism, I define it as organized responses to the ecological crisis by Jews. It's inspired by the sources of Judaism and it, it is carried out uh, within Jewish social institution. If, what kind of an activities con uh, constitute Jewish environmentalism? Well, most of it is really about environmental education, and I'll give you examples as, as we go along. Uh, it's also environmental advocacy, advocacy and finally, uh, reinterpretation and reconstruction of Jewish texts and rituals in life of environmental uh, values. So the people who are involved in this movement and know the Jewish tradition in various levels, I cannot tell you that some of them know a lot, some of them know less than, than that. Uh, so you have various degrees of familiarity with the tradition, uh, but you also look at the eco-crisis today as, as a spiritual and moral crisis rather than a merely scientific crisis to which there is a technological solution. And the bottom line is that you really look at Judaism as relevant to the solution of the crisis. So um, Jewish environmental, um, uh, the Jewish environmental spirituality is very connected to another phenomenon in our life, the phenomenon that I would call post-secularism, not just me, a lot of other scholars look at it as post-secularism. And here, what it means is that the way we looked and the, the secular world or the way secularity and secularism were understood in the first part of the 20th century, that's no longer 
uh, relevant. Today, we live in a different kind of world, in a different moment, a different cultural moment, uh, in which uh, we can think about the role that religion plays in public life. So it's no longer compartmentalized between the private and the public. It's much more available on the pub, in the public context. And that's what we mean by post-secular. So religious environmentalism is post-secular in the sense that it encompasses physical, emotional, and mental dimensions of humanity. It challenges the reductionist view of the human, either the materialistic reductionism that denies non-physicalist features of being human, or the contrary form of reduction, which reduces the individual human to just rational cognition, uh, disregarding social and emotional dimensions. So in the post-secular world, we have all of those aspects and that's what I mean by a holistic conception of reality. We really understand that matter is now suffused with consciousness, with intelligence, and with vitality. And we think totally different about the environmental uh, world. So I've mentioned several times already the notion that we are living in a, in, in a crisis, that uh, the ecological crisis is a reality. Uh, denying it is impossible, or at least makes no intellectual sense. Here are the features, some of the features and some of the examples of what does it mean to live in the midst of an ecological crisis. So we have global warming, we have shifting weather patterns. We had extreme weather events. I don't have to tell you about that. Israel, of course, experiences very much. I'm here in Arizona, and we obviously have to contend with much hotter uh, summers than before. We have retreat of glaciers. We have mega droughts and desertification. And desertification, of course, is an example that Israel is very familiar with, uh, since it is really on, on, on the border between Mizraim and Yeshimon, as we used to talk about it in the, in the 60s or even a little bit before. Um, so you have, you really get a sense that we are living on, on bor borrowed time with mass extinction of species, loss of biodiversity, acidification, and of course, pollution, that's a major problem. So that's our uh, point of departure. And my message to you this uh, afternoon or it's it's an evening where you are it's morning where i am that religion and judaism in particular helps us to frame the right response to the ecological crisis religion is crucially relevant to climate advocacy to environmental education and to thinking about human flourishing in the moment that now scientists call the anthropocene so religious environmentalism is the, enables us to mobilize religious beliefs and practices to address the eco uh, crisis. But we've got a problem, again, going back to the ambiguity of the modern situation. Who is a Jewish environmentalist? So on this slide, you have five people, very influential, I'll say a word about them. Uh, very influential people who really changed the course of environmentalism in America. If I start on the left, that's Maury Bookchin. I'll tell you more about him. He comes from a communist or a leftist, very left uh, orientation, and he's the father of what we call social ecology. This is Barry Commoner, a person who will tell us a lot about energy and the relationship between energy and environmentalism. He's the one, as you know, who articulated the uh, four laws of ecology, I'll say about a few words about him. Here we, we have Paul Ehrlich, a very important person who talked about overpopulation as a threat. The person here probably may not be known to many of you. Uh, this is a woman known as Star Hawk, but she was actually born Miriam Simus. And she is connected to the goddess religion, a major, major figure in America who published more books than all of these men put together uh, in terms of um, number of publications that she has managed to produce. She's very influential and she is part of the story that I will tell you. This is Peter Singer, the person who is very known to all of us in terms of um, animal liberation. 
So here are a few words just to bring you to uh, kind of the, the, the gist of why it's complicated to, when we say who is a Jewish environmentalist. So if you look at Mori Bookchin, Mori Bookchin is the person associated with social ecology. Uh, the main idea of social ecology, it's in the middle of your screen, that human responsibility toward nature could be carried out only if humans first eliminate social exploitation, domination, and hierarchy by communitarianism. Now look at the dates. In 1958, this is way before the environmental movement really takes off. He already spoke about the problem of chemicals in food. 1962, he published under the pseudonym of Lewis Herber, the book, and a small book known as, uh, uh, the title was Orange Synthetic Environment. And this came out six months before Rachel Carson published her famous book, Silent Spring. 1974 is when he established the Institute of Social Ecology. And I gave you the main idea here. And here you have some of his famous books, very influential books. Well, it, why do I include him? I include him because the major insight of social ecology, I think, is very much a secularization of biblical ideas. And even though we are dealing here with a person who was a formal member of the Communist uh, Party in America, then uh, he was in the, originally a Trotskyist, then he moved away, became an anarchist. But I think I look at him as very much part of the story. Uh, and, and this is an example of what secularization was about, at least in the first half of the 20th century. If you go to this famous character, Barry Commoner, Barry Commoner, uh, influenced uh, the, the environmental movement. He's a, he's a scientist, a cellular biologist. He was very uh, active uh, in politics also, 1980. This was him in 1980 when he runs a, as, as a presidential candidate on, you know, under the banner of the Citizens Party. He was a professor of plant physiology at Washington University in St. Louis and the founder of the Center for the uh, Biology of Natural Systems. So he is a scientist, but a scientist that really understood the social uh, impact of what's happening with, <laughs> with our activity. And that these are his famous four laws of ecology. Everything is connected to everything else. Everything must go somewhere. So that's why we have pollution issues. It goes somewhere. And if we don't deal with it correctly, it's gonna choke us up. The pollution is gonna choke the, the, the planet up. Nature knows best. So humans are not the ones who know best that nature knows best. And there is no such thing as a free lunch. So this is a, his famous book from 1970, The Closing Circle. Uh, this is his other very influential book on the politics of energy, where he addressed the connection between environment, energy, and economy, the, the three E's. And his point was that industries that use uh, the most energy had the highest negative impact on the environment. So here is an example of how a secular Jew totally transformed the political conversation in the United States. Uh, another person, another secular Jew comes from more connected, uh, at least on his mother's side, to reform movement, he, although which is not secular. Uh, Ra uh, Paul Ralph Ehrlich is another scientist, a biologist uh, who was um, working primarily at Stanford University. And he is the first person to warn us about overpopulation. When population undergoes exponential growth, um, it experiences a subsequent crash as it is, has grown beyond what the environment can support. So he concluded that humanity was due for cataclysmic downsizing of the population. Well, a lot of what, he's pre what he predicted both has been challenged, has been debated, uh, and was not proven necessarily to be, um, he did, his prediction didn't all come true, but the general direction, I think, is still very relevant. Human expansion and consumption is out of control and is unsustainable. And if the population, and, and we need to kind of figure out how to curb overpopulation. The two other thinkers that I mentioned already, this is the famous uh, Peter Singer. Uh, and here you have an attempt to apply ethics to environmental issues. He's a utilitarian and he believes the utilitarian concept is the way to think about environmentalism. 
uh, and environmental issues. And his point is that we need to treat animals not as something less than us, but as sentient beings that deserve all, all they uh, kind of deserve the same moral consideration. So he is, the big, he is the very much at the forefront of environmental ethics in the early 70s. So he, he has many books, but these are just two examples how much he has influenced our understanding of uh, animal liberation uh, and, and kind of ethic, ethical living when it comes to eating as well as when it comes to consumption of, uh, of animals. And the last example of a secular uh, a Jew who is very influential in America, actually all over the world, this is Miriam Simons, that's, that's her given name, but she publishes under this uh, assumed name. She's known to everybody as Star Hawk. This book, uh, The Spiral, um, th sorry, this book, The Spiral Dance, this is the one that was sold 300,000 copies in America. Uh, this is an example how her ideas actually uh, are ex exemplified in rituals. So these are people who are all connected to the goddess movement, to neo-paganism. She is extremely influential. Her major theory or thesis is that the earth is a living entity and she offers us nature-based spirituality that can open, open us up uh, in terms of more subtle understanding how the natural uh, world works. So he, she's an ecofeminist, she's connected to goddess religion, she's very influential. All of these people, I think, are examples of secular Jews who shape the conversation in America. But the field of religion and ecology actually started only in 1967 with this guy. <clears throat> with Lynn White Jr. who argued that the problem of our, eco of our ecological crisis goes back all the way to the Bible. The Bible is the cause because the Bible uh, gave humanity the license to have dominion over the earth. And, she, and he was the first to really say, let's look at the religious problem or identify the roots with religion and then try to uh, address it. Of course, he did it first within Christianity. He's arguing that within Christianity, Christians need to go back to the spiritual traditions of St. Francis and from that model, really think how to treat uh, the natural world differently. His argument was that Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion, and as such, it is very destructive to the natural environment. He, by training, was an, uh, a, a historian of technology, focuses on the Malaysians, but that little, very, very short essay, only about four pages, uh, really shifted and gave rise to a new field. And that's the field. The field is the field of religion and ecology. I gave you the pictures of two people who are crucial in this field. Uh, this is Mary Evelyn Tucker, and that's her husband, John Grimm. She's a scholar of, New of Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism. He's, he's a scholar of indigenous religions. And what you have here are the 10 volumes. You can see my volume is this one in the green, but these are the 10 volumes that came out of this series of lectures about world religions and, uh, and the environment or and ecology as they called it. And that's how the field emerged in the mid nineties. And what the field is doing is this, it re-examines how the canonic traditions portrays the natural world. It also recovers text that offer non-exploitative attitudes to the natural world. And it seeks to reconstruct eco, eco sorry, it should be eco-theologies, not eco-technology, eco-theologies that offer views of the human as part of nature. That's a mistake on my slide. So when it comes to the Abrahamic tradition, what we see out of these um, kind of new approaches is a focus on creation care. This is the concept here, creation care. The world belongs to God rather than to humans. Humans are entrusted to take care of the world, namely to act as stewards or engage in stewardship. And the Bible is not the problem because the Bible harbors deep ecological wisdom. 
So all this is very much what they continue to do. You can go on the website of the Yale Forum of Religion and Ecology. I guess I should have put it in. The Yale Forum of Religion and Ecology, you will find endless, endless uh, resources to think about the relevance of religion, all world religions, to the environmental crisis. So these two people who happen to be good friends of mine, I have to admit, uh, really are single-handedly responsible for, for this field. They're not alone in the field, of course, there are other people, but as far as leadership was concerned, this is it, they are the ones. So now we begin with, to look more carefully at some of the Jewish uh, story, uh, kind of the, the contributors to the Jewish story, and what we have here, I give you examples of some of the pioneering uh, thinkers and, and also she's not just a thinker, but also a doer. I'll get to her in a minute. But here are some of the people who really shaped the discussion about Jewish environmentalism. So the person to our left is, of course, Abraham Joshua Heschel. So Heschel was not technically an environmental thinker, but he really inspired I would say practically all the religious uh, Jewish environmentalists and uh, environmentalists both in Israel and the United States are inspired by Heschel because Heschel spoke about kind of the depth, the, the, the ecological depth, if you wish, that we can gain once we understand the concept of wonder. If we look at the world from the perspective of wonder, uh, we can see the complexity of the world. It's not just materialistic. There is another depth to it, a spiritual depth to it. He, of course, comes from a Hasidic background and he uses Hasidic theology to um, kind of undergird uh, what uh, he, his worldview. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to get into it. That's another lecture, but there's no way to talk about Jewish environmentalism without mentioning Heschel. This second person, of course, known to many of you, I assume, Zalman Shachter Shalomi, uh, he is connected with the, Jew he is the Jewish renewal movement. He passed away in 2014. And Shachter Shalomi really created a lot of the, um, the theoretical uh, kind of the, the principles that I will talk about and the ambience and the values and the, not so much the norms, but especially the values and the approach uh, it's all due to him and his particular interpretation of Kabbalah and Hasidism and how it applied to environmentalism. This is Arthur Waskow still with us. He's in his late 80s and uh, Waskow uh, translated many ideas of, uh, uh, of Zalman into action through his uh, organizations associated with the Jewish renewal movement, but he ran a particular institute, the Aleph uh, Center for uh, Jewish Renewal, and he's uh, a very important environmental thinker, activist, educator. So a lot in America, we, all those who consider some Jewish environmentalists owe an awful lot to Arthur Waskow. This is Art Green, Arthur Green. He's a scholar, originally a scholar of Kabbalah, not originally still is a scholar of Kabbalah. He was uh, born 1941, uh, a very influential figure, both in the academic study of Judaism, but also in reconstructionist Judaism. And he uh, inspired, basically works on articulating Kabbalah for the, as he calls it, Kabbalah for the environmental age, how Kabbalistic ideas can inspire our environmental sensibility. Uh, so at least two of them are connected, actually three of them are connected with, reconst with the Reconstructionist movement, whereas this person, Rich Richard H. Schwartz, is an Orthodox uh, person, a very important uh, uh, person who contributed to um, his uh, kind of, how shall I put it, emphasis on Judaism and, and global, as he called it, that's the title of one of his books, Judaism and Global Survival and to veganism. So he argues, this is why this picture is appropriate, he argues that veganism is the right way to go and uh, has, has been very influential uh, in, in the um, discourse on, Jude on religion and environment. Here we have another early pioneer, uh, that's Edward Gendler, also uh, in his late 80s now, uh, associated with the conservative movement, uh, an early promoter of environmentalism. Uh, 
fabulous human being, Everett Gendler. Uh, that's uh, Larry Troster, who unfortunately we lost a about a year ago, actually a little over a year ago. Uh, he is a very important uh, contributor to environmentalism, especially in the conservative movement, and also to Jewish Christian relations because he was very active in green faith. So that's Larry Troster who passed away from cancer unfortunately. And this is the woman who created the movement. This is Ellen Bernstein. Uh, and she created the movement of Jewish environmentalism in America. Uh, she created the first organization, Shomre Adama. Uh, originally, she was a rafting instructor on the Colorado, then turns to her back to her Jewish roots and, be, and, and creates this uh, activity uh, of Jewish environmental movement. Uh, and it was all done in Philadelphia. There's a story here, how Philadelphia is very important. Several of these people are connected to that city. So here are, are some examples of uh, contributors to the movement that I will now unpack for you. Uh, you don't need to, to uh, remember those names, but maybe uh, if you're in Israel, you are probably familiar with these people. This is Anat Kramer, who is the, uh, uh, director of Teva Ivri. I will say more about Teva Ivri at the end of the story. This is Elon Schwartz. Uh, Elon, Jeremy Benstein, and Tal Alon, these are all leading uh, environmentalists in Israel, both uh, organizationally, conceptually, politically. Uh, each one of them, I would say, and actually all four, uh, you can look at them as people who are disciples of Heschel. All three, these three all came from the United States, settled in Israel in the 1980s, and really shaped the conversation in Israel. So to some extent, you can say that a religious environmentalism is an import, on, to some extent, not entirely uh, from America to Israel, but these four are all in Israel. The people here are all in the United States, so we already met Roger Gottlieb. This is Eric Katz, a very important contributor to the, uh, to the academic discourse. This is uh, Brad Artson, Bradley Artson, uh, who is a conservative, associated with the conservative movement, one of the early people to write about environmentalism. Here we have a rabbi by the name uh, of, oh, just uh, her last name just escaped me. It will come to me uh, uh, in a minute. Her name is uh, Jill uh, Hammer, Jill Hammer. And she's associated with an organization called Kohenet Institute. She is a kind of an example how you can bind Judaism, believe it or not, and goddess religion. So there, she, she's very important in that. Uh, I will say more about this person here, that's Rabbi Zeli Golden. You cannot imagine him as a rabbi, but he is ordained by Shalom Shachta Shalomi, uh, very important in what we call in America, Earth-based Judaism. Here we have a philosopher, an environmental philosopher, Sandra Lubarsky, um, who is also kind of uh, coming at it from philosophical perspective. This person here may be more known, that's Judith Plaska, who is very important in Jewish feminism. She really is the Jewish feminist thinker in America. Uh, and a lot of her work pertains to ecological, uh, kind of the, the connection between gender and ecology. This is Lynn Gottlieb, also connection of gender and ecology. Uh, she's a rabbi in New Mexico, actually, very important in goddess religion and its adaptation to Judaism. Uh, next to her is Nathan Margalit, uh, who teaches uh, Organic Torah, that's the name of his organization. So these two people, Nathan Margulit and the person next to him, David Seidenberg, are example of how uh, knowledge of the religious tradition can really be translated into activism. That's another, that's Jonathan Nereel, who is also active in Israel as well, the United States, and I already spoke about these people. So just to give you kind of the flavor of what it means or who are the people that are, invite, uh, are considered Jewish environmentalists. And if you don't know any of them, that's okay too, because that's part of the problem. The movement is still not as well known as it should be or could be. So he, I'm gonna spend some time on this slide now as I, I move from talking about people to talking about ideas. So, here are some of, I, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds and into the technicalities and, uh, of interpreting text, but just to give you a flavor of what are the principles of Jewish environmentalism. So um, the basic three 
uh, views or beliefs that you need to keep in mind are creation, revelation, and redemption. So Judaism, if you want to reduce Judaism to three ideas, it's creation, revelation, and redemption. That's the framework of all of Jewish environmental ethics and activism. And if you look at the official statements of the various environmental movements, you will also see some, re some reference to these ideas. So they are, they be, theological beliefs are not just theological beliefs that are always translated into action, primarily through education, of course. But if I, if I want to look at, okay, Tachles, what does it all mean to be a Jewish environmentalist? I will start with this notion that creation really uh, 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 is a gift. God is the sole creator and sustainer of nature. Uh, therefore, nature, if you think about nature as, re, as creation, nature is not inert matter, but it's matter imbued with religious significance. So the created world ultimately belongs to God. That I think is really, really important, which is right here. The, the, the world does not belong to us and therefore we don't have the right to destroy it. That's kind of to put it bluntly. Um, the created world belongs to God and God has commanded humanity to take care of the natural world. So if we want to address our eco-crisis, we need to look at nature as divine creation. And the doctrine of creation provides a moral and spiritual map that enables us to see the significance of things and then move faithfully through the world. That's why when uh, Everett Gendler, Rabbi Everett Gendler, Gendler started Jewish environmental kind of conversation, he stated that environmental crisis is the unmaking of creation. So what we are now trying to do is to overcome that fact. How can we not undo creation? How can environmental uh, degradation can be seen as an offense to God? It should be seen as sin. And we all need to repent for that sin if you really want to go in, the, in a more kind of a, a Christian laden uh, approach. So why is it primarily due to us? Because humans are created in the um, image of God. So the doctrine of creation in the image of God, Selem Elohim, that doctrine means that we really have a certain, a certain obligation, whether it's due to free will, whether it's due to our intellect, whether it's due to our personhood, there are various ways to explain that con concept. But the point is that we need to care. We need to do what we are uh, tasked to do. And the task is understood in terms of responsibility. So humans are responsible to God and responsible for the world. So we can go through life, they, whatever 70 to 120, whatever years we are fortunate to live, we cannot go through life Disignore, kind of ignoring or not paying attention to environmental issues. It's our job, it's our responsibility to care. Now, why should we care? We care because of the concept of covenant. We humans, especially Israel, have a covenantal relationship with God. And that relationship with God is illustrated in attitude toward the land of Israel. So the land of Israel in the Bible is crucial to the relationship between Israel and God, and you cannot really ignore that covenantal dimension. When Israel be behaves properly, the land of Israel is fertile and fecund. When Israel stops doing it and, and, and sins, then the land becomes unfertile, and ultimately God has no choice but exiling the people of Israel from the land of Israel. That's basically the biblical perspective. So the condition, the, ma the major insight here is the condition of the land of Israel manifests the dynamic relationship between God and Israel. And that I think is uh, clearly shared by a lot of people involved here. So if you want to go to the biblical text, of course, you have two texts. You have Genesis, um, Genesis 128, where it seems that God gives dominion to the human, but you know, the Jewish environmentalists teach us to go to another text, and that's Genesis 2.15, where God is telling the, or the biblical narrative tells us that the human was placed in the Garden of Eden to protect 
and till or tend or observe and keep uh, the garden. So we need to begin to think of ourselves as gardeners, as people who are, whose task is protection and vitality, ensuring the vitality of the garden. If you want another biblical me uh, metaphor, you can think about the human as a shepherd. That's another very important biblical metaphor. But the bottom line is that we are tasked to take care of the natural world. How do we do it? Well, we can do it through protective protection of biodiversity. Definitely the biblical text tells us quite a lot how to protect diversity, how to ensure that there's a lot of um, biblical information kind of about how not to mix and match various, uh, various uh, species, uh, right? That's Genesis 131. Uh, and the idea here is the Bible can be read through a different lens, a, a lens that articulates new Jewish ethics for the preservation of species and ecosystems. We go here, uh, we have to put a limit on our human consumptions of animal. That's what kashrut is all about. You can look at kashrut uh, from an environmental perspective. So from that perspective, it's very important to realize that we can eat less and not just in terms of quantity, but in terms of what we eat. Um, system of food production in today contributes to about 25% to 37% of all greenhouse gas emission in the United States. So the more we, we, we change the way we produce food, how we produce food, how we market food, how we eat, all that is very much part of what we can do to uh, change. And the Jewish tradition gives us kind of the direction to think about. That direction includes also concern for animal welfare. That's how the principle of Tzar Ba'alei Chaim. You're not supposed to inflict unnecessary pain. Um, we have to be concerned about future generations and ensure that we the, 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 the various species will continue to be able to reproduce. Of course, we have to avoid wanton destruction. That's the principle of Baltashrit, which has a lot of halachic uh, uh, development, kind of how, how that principle was uh, understood and interpreted in variety of contexts. Uh, we have to be concerned about pollution because pollution has to deal with what we do vis-a-vis -vis other people, not just the natural world. So there is, there is a connection between environmentalism social justice, and of course, prevention of pollution. Uh, the Sabbath and the sabbatical year, these are very important uh, insights of the Jewish environmental movement. Uh, and, and here, without getting into the details of it, uh, because that would be very important to Jewish environmental organizations in Israel, how to turn the sabbatical year into a principle that can inspire new ways of living today in Israel, but also other parts of the world. So the Jewish environmental kind of these principles, uh, which are distilled primarily from the notion of Shabbat and, and, and Shemitah, the sabbatical year, are all seeing a, a close connection between social justice and eco-justice. If you're going to take care of the people who need to be taken care of, the poor, the marginal, the, the widow, the orphan, all the people who are vulnerable, if you take care of them and you treat them with justice, then the land will be fertile. They, there's, you, you, they, there is a connection, even though it sounds odd, why would the land be fertile if I treat other people more justly? But, but there is, that's exactly the concept uh, of eco kashrut which uh, was articulated, or eco kosher which was articulated by Zalman Shachter Shalomi and popularized by Arthur Waskow. That's basically the issue. How, how we treat other people justly is connected to the well-being of the soil, of you know, how, how animals can or cannot thrive on this earth, and so forth. So if you ask me kind of an overall value of all this is a lot of people in the, in the Jewish environmental movement, of course, refer to tikkun olam. So tikkun olam is this over value, kind of uh, meta value or meta ethical value that inspires all this activism. So now with a better sense of kind of get the main point here is that we have within the tradition a lot of principles 
that we can un unpack and apply to specific situations and tease out from them the right way uh, to act toward the environment. So here is kind of a, a summary of the most important organization today. It wasn't like that way originally, but today this is the most important organization of, of Jewish environmental movement in the United States. That's called Chazon, Jewish Lab for Sustainability. So that's the logo, of course. And what I give you is kind of a summary of some of their uh, activities, some of their programs. So just again, you'll get a flavor what they are about. So Yofi or Joffi in, Amer in, in the way Americans relate to it is uh, Jewish uh, outdoors food farming and environmental education. So they do many, many programs. Uh, the Jewish food movement is growing by leaps and bounds, all organized by Chazon. Um, they do an annual food festival uh, and, and it, it really is, it, it brings in different kind of uh, interests and, and activism and concerns. Uh, so the kind of the farm to table movement is part of the Jewish uh, food movement as much as organic farming is also part of the story. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on, uh, on uh, doing farming even in urban environments through community gardens. Um, urban Adama, for example, is, a, is an organization in Berkeley, California. But there's a lot of uh, understanding that we can change things. We don't have to own whatever, 25 acres in order to engage in farming. Farming can be done even in, in, in an urban environment. Um, bike rides, that has to do with environmentalism and transportation. So this is an example how bike rides, which are done in Israel and America, are done. Uh, this is the Isabella uh, Friedman Jewish Retreat Center. It's uh, it was it's now owned by Chazon. Didn't start with Chazon. This is a much older. Um, actually, used to be a girls a girls uh, summer camp, and now it's from the 1890s even. Uh, but it's now all part of Chazon, and you can see how uh, there are a lot of different activities which combine. Uh, food concerns, uh, transportation issues, uh, spirituality, real engagement in spiritual activity, uh, and uh, education, and so forth. So Elat Chaim is this, this is in Elat Chaim, this is one kind of an activity which is all part of the Isabella Friedman Center, uh, just to give you a, a kind of the, uh, the flair or the flavor of uh, Jewish environmental activism in America. And I need to uh, kind of uh, go a little bit faster now, so we can we can uh, finish it uh, uh, and leave some time for for discussion with you. Um, here are uh, some examples of the kind of organizational uh, interest uh, that that um, I, I mentioned. So a lot of the most of what our, uh, Jewish environmental organizations do is this educational ecological education, um, but. And so here are just two examples, the Pearlstone Center in Maryland. Um, and and the, in these places, you can have programs in a given year for several thousand people. But I cannot tell you what these people do when they're not in the center. But edu education about environmental challenges and what to do about it and how to link it to Judaism, that's all done here. Uh, Earth by Judaism, this is our visual. This is Zelig, whom I showed you earlier. Here's an example of how he pushes kind of uh, um, practicing Judaism in nature and integrating his love of nature, concern of nature. He's an environmental lawyer by training and who became a rabbi. This is, this is a very good representation what he's about. That's the name of his organization, Wilderness Torah. Jewish farming and Jewish food movement I already mentioned. Climate advocacy is now the in thing. We have new organizations such as Dayenu, a Jewish call for climate to climate action. There are other organizations uh, like the Jewish Climate Action Network. They're all engaged uh, in, in concern about climate change and what Jews can do and should do. And uh, they're more interested in social justice and the, and the social dimension of the impact of climate change. Uh, a major source is a team. A team is a uh, is a kind of a transformation of what used to be the uh, the Green Zionist uh, Alliance, and uh, now it's called a team, um, ecological Judaism, and they are basically a resource as well. It's a resource for a lot of uh, information 
uh, that, that, that you can uh, learn if you want to become a Jewish environmental activist or just to learn more about it. Uh, when I go to, the, uh, to Israel, Israel has, of course, different story, different focus, but a lot of it actually is inspired. This is the most, uh, the best example. Uh, Heschel, Merkaz Heschel, Amachon Israeli L'Chashiva Manigut Svivati was created by Elon Schwartz and um, Jeremy Benstein. And uh, they do a lot of programs, so I, 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 can't, I don't have time now to go over it. But if you just Google it and see the kind of activities that you have there, uh, how they combine a Jewish inspiration. Here, Heschel is really the, the model um, that, that could give you a sense why Jewish environment, religious environmentalism can happen also in Israel. It's even more so in Teva Ivri. This is a Nat Kremer, and the Shemitah Israelit is one of their major initiatives. So Google her up, and you'll see an awful lot of activities related to Shemitah and how you can take an ancient idea and transform it to contemporary life. Arava Institute was created by Alon Tal, and Jeremy Benstein here, it's more uh, a, a kind of educational, environmental education, but also connected to Israeli Arab or Israeli Palestinian conflict. They are really about bringing peace to the Middle East through environmental uh, activism. And this is a picture from Bustan, yet another initiative also interested in Arab Jewish collaboration around environment. So to kind of uh, summarize, so what does it mean to be an environmental Jew? So you have to be informed about ecological crisis. Uh, you need to be attentive to the sciences. So all this work, even though I spoke about the religious only, but there's a lot of scientific knowledge that you need to be attentive to. You uh, have to be, if you want to call yourself a Jewish environmental activist or so, it's good to be engaged in the Jewish literary tradition from ecological perspective. Um, people like Ellen Bernstein has, uh, you know, brought our attention to the agricultural roots of many Jewish festivals, of course, Pesach, but also Sukkot and Shavuot. Uh, and to Israelis, that may be obvious, but to Americans, it's not so obvious. Uh, I just participated in her Seder, uh, ecological Seder that was done for the first time this year on Zoom due to the Corona. It was fabulous. Integrating the physical and spiritual aspects of Judaism, you want to be implementing environmentally sound practices in whatever organization you're in, you can do it in a social environmental institution. Uh, you interact with other with non Jews, especially faith, uh, other religious uh, environmentalists who operate in a different environment, a different religious context, most of it Christianity, but also Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, and often it leads to uh, activism on the political level. So what's my take home message? My take home message is that uh, Judaism harbors deep ecological wisdom that is most relevant to the ecological crisis. Um, the Jewish environmental approach or environmental movement promotes a holistic interconnected view of reality. We are all connected, humans, plants, soil, animals. We are all connected and interdependent. Uh, we need to be very informed of, of science, of um, ecological sciences and environmental sciences, but not to think that science necessarily translates into a technological solution. That's, that's really one of the arguments that is challenged here. Um, and Judaism makes a unique contribution to this, to this um, um, conundrum that we're all in. And uh, it's thriving today, both in the diaspora as well as in Israel. And I think it offers a way to be Jewish today, to especially to young Jews who felt, uh, at least in America, who felt kind of disengaged from the tradition. One way of getting back is through environmentalism. So uh, with that, I'm going to tell you all thank you. And I look forward to uh, suggestion, comments, or, or questions that you may have. And hopefully, Dawn, maybe you can uh, give me some questions that appear. For some reason, I don't see how I can get back to the uh, Q&A or to the chat. Maybe you can, you can help. Maybe if I stop sharing my screen, I can do that. Thank you very much, Professor. There is a question. Um, the Many of the organizations, or most of the organizations that you showed us are um, uh, reform movement organizations or conservative movement organizations? Are there any that are more uh, religious uh, or even Haredi? 
Okay, so I sh you're right. That's a very good point. I could have and I should have uh, included a reference to organization. I, I, to my knowledge, is no longer in existence. But there was an organization called Kanfeine Sharim that was actually created by an Orthodox woman, Yvonne Marzouk, and Yvonne uh, actually um, her focus was on Orthodox day schools. So she showed how you can, within an Orthodox day school environment, uh, teach the students from a very young age uh, to care about nature, to look at the uh, biblical or rabbinic texts from an environmentalist perspective. So it's really a form of environmental education implemented in Orthodox schools. So that is uh, definitely the case. There are people uh, it, in Israel, it's a little bit more complicated, but um, even within the Orthodox community in Israel, you have attentiveness uh, to some environmental challenges, such as, such as pollution, for example. And actually, in some ways, in the Orthodox community, you can do a little bit more because uh, you can, because you have the halachic power, you actually can... can uh, uh, impose certain behavior, if not impose, maybe it's too strong, but you can legislate a certain behavior or you can, through halachic emphasis, you can bring people to do the right thing ecologically. So I really don't see a necessary conflict between being an Orthodox Jew and being environmentally concerned. On the contrary, I think that the more you care about the natural world and, and look at it as a created world, the more you can uh, be attentive to this environmental outlook. Thank you very go much. On, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. The, um, the organizations you mentioned uh, are mostly into education for environmentalism. Is there anyone that does anything more practical? Um, well, what do you mean by practical? I mean, some of the people, some organizations actually started with hiking. How to, it, it was all about how do you practice Judaism, including Shabbat, including some of the festivals, you can actually practice Judaism in a natural environment or how you can get to love the natural world through your body, through walking. So there is an organization called Walking Stick or, or, or there, there is an organization, it, it one, some, one of the problems I should have said, is, I should have mentioned, one of the problems that many organizations don't have a long, a long life. A lot of times you can start something and within 10, 15 years, that organization, usually from lack of funding, that organization uh, doesn't last. So um, how to deal with that kind of problem, how to ensure the durability of Jewish environmental organization is a major challenge to which I don't think there's a good solution. Some of the funding come from private organization like the, um, um, some the uh, what's his name the Joseph Foundation, but I forgot the first the first name. Uh, so there are some foundations, the the Jim Joseph Foundation. So there are, there are foundations that provide help, but on the whole, Jewish environmental organizations really are struggling with funding, and uh, that actually undermines uh, their ability to be more effective. So I would love to see more funding through the in America is through the federation system or through private sources, give support to that, uh, in, to those initiatives. There are many initiatives, but how to keep them going year in and year out is always a challenge. I, I cannot tell you otherwise. Go ahead, who else would like Thank to ask a question? Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel asked, um, what about the JNF KKL organization, uh, Karen Kayemet uh, Israel? Yes. And I, I believe her question refers to, are they considered an environmental uh, organization. Yes, in many ways, yes, I, I definitely could have included them. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, they, um, uh, Karen Kayemet still owns, I believe, 13% of uh, public land in Israel, and definitely uh, they are involved uh, in environmental activism. The problem is somewhat complex because some of the earlier activities of the Karen Kayemet Israel were actually environmentally problematic. Uh, certain uh, species were introduced into, uh, the, into Israel which were problematic environmentally and then you had to uh, 
turn things around and, and, and deal with some problems. But on the whole, yes, you can definitely, and I should have included uh, the Karen Kayemet is uh, an organization that is at least involved in uh, many activities that have environmental uh, implications and significance. Well, I'm gonna open microphones uh, so that people can thank you or ask any further questions. Um, there is, There are a few interesting conversations going on in the chat room. Uh, yeah, let please, me go to the chat. Please let be courteous see. one to another and open your microphones in turn. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you in our next events. Okay, Dawn. So I'm staying here and waiting for people to pose questions. Is that how it works for you? No, no. The, the microphones are open. People can open their microphones and ask questions personally. Just uh, please, uh, I, I'm asking to be courteous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I... Um, uh, water rights, especially river water rights activist. So I, I'm very much interested about this um, lecture that has been done by professor. So I will continue to hear and I learn, I like to learn more things from uh, the uh, Jewish environmentalism. It's very the foundational uh, thinking. I hope it will give some um, present time, the environmental problems uh, and uh, the uh, some uh, answer from uh, this um, uh, website, uh, Jewish fundamentalism. Uh, we will get the 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 scholar of the environmental scholars who will learn many things from this uh, website. Thank you very much. We will continue. Yeah, and I uh, I think. My response would be uh, that I think that the environmental crisis should be the foundation of collaboration and cooperation, not just between religious traditions that a lot of time have been either in conflict or in uh, tension with each other, but we have no choice. Nobody in the world today has any other choice but to collaborate. That's as simple as that. And even though collaboration and cooperation is difficult, I'm not of not ignorant about that difficulty or not oblivious to it. I think that because we have no choice and time is running out and if it's not gonna happen in this decade, it's not gonna happen. And this will be a disaster for generations. So we have no choice but to collaborate. In Israel in particular, that collaboration is essential. And I agree with you that water and water issues is, is at the bottom of a lot of the a conflict and will be more so all over the world, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. And therefore, collaboration is the solution. And collaboration takes ability to listen, an ability to recognize difference, an ability to live with discomfort, and to know that, yes, your neighbor is different from you and has different views, different beliefs, different practices, but you have no choice but living next to each other and with each other. So that's the challenge for the 21st century. And now is the time to handle the challenge or else in a sense, we are all, we are all doomed. So I, I, I don't wanna leave you with a doom and gloom message, but the challenge is serious. So how, other questions? How about, uh, can I add my thanks to your most informative and compelling lecture? Uh, could I ask you to supply us with your email address so that we might address uh, other issues to you and possible future lecture opportunities. Sure, um, Dawn will do me a favor. <laughs> My uh, are, you in, are you in Israel? No, 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 I'm in, I'm in Tempe, Arizona. That's ah, where the Arizona State University is. So okay. uh, Tempe is part of the Phoenix Metropolitan, but my email is very simple. It's chava.samuelson at asu.edu. Uh, Doron, if you can put it into the chat, uh, I would appreciate that. Okay. It's, it's there that? right now. Okay, good. thank you. Can you put it back uh, so, on? Yeah, people are welcome to, to write to me. Uh, I've lectured, actually, I, I hear your British accent, and I have to tell you that I've done a very interesting uh, seminar with a, Jew, with a um, Christian and a Muslim theologians and me, yeah. the Jewish theologian, and we had this, we did that a, a webinar in the beginning of the Corona crisis. It was done in April, 2020. 
and it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, so yes, I would like uh, more people in England to be as engaged as some <laughs> of the people are in the oh. United States. And I really believe in, in religious collaboration and cooperation and interfaith collaboration and cooperation. And I can, I, I'll be very glad to, to speak to your audience and, and uh, get more people involved. I really think the time is running out and we've got to put this as number one on the agenda. Uh, despite my uh, living in Israel for 20 years, I haven't lost my English accent. <laughs> That's a compliment. So I'm, That's okay. I'm interested in your speaking in Israel. Oh, in there. Israel, yeah. anytime, sure, okay. sure, anytime. And you also have some wonderful people, really wonderful environmentalists who are, I mean, Alon Tal, Jerem Benstein, all of these people that I mentioned, and Nat Kramer, they are, they are wonderful people, really okay. doing... Uh, uh, important work on all levels, scientific, uh, social, even psychological, aesthetic, religious, you name it. So Israel should be leading the way, I think, in many ways uh, of this kind of, uh, uh, you know, inter faith, let's call it faith-based or inter-religious type activity. Any Thank other you. question? I see from Lisa. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. This was most interesting. And uh, I one one question, one comment. The question is, um, can can you give us the uh, name of the couple in the beginning of your lecture and their pamphlet or uh, series? Um, and the second thing is, um, I've been involved with. Uh, um, teaching about nature through museum. And I've read many nature writers, uh, pieces on nature. Um, and what I find important is that this information has to really come out into the mainstream. Even if it is in some other mainstream, religious, cultural, uh, even a country, a specific country, it is not quite out there in, in a way that would make um, the general public aware. And just as we are becoming more and more aware of the connections that Native Americans have to the earth, I think few people, and I'm not I'm just speaking in generalities now, but few people have an awareness that uh, that Judaism could be tied to the land and to uh, nature in general, and that in our readings, we can find those connections as well. And yeah. so I would say that even me, who, who I, I mean, I have many, many nature books from many well-known nature, American nature writers. Um, this aspect uh, of uh, connecting um, religion or a faith or a religious group is, is not really well known in uh, the general mainstream. Yeah, and if, yeah. we could, if we could just go to, uh, not now in COVID, but for example, if we could do a search, um, if we are made aware, if we, if we see prompts of books of this nature, and finally, when we are able to get back out to bookstores again, to be able to see this highlighted, it will become more of the American conscious uh, yes, yeah. which yeah. which I believe needs needs to be more of. Sure. So so the, you make very good points. So the first informative uh, question you had, maybe Doron, you can put it into the chat. It's Mary Evelyn Tucker, T U C K E R. Mary Evelyn Tucker and her husband John Grimm. Those are the two people who are the movers and shakers, if you wish, of the. Uh, uh, of the field of religion and ecology. There are other activists, but these are the two people that I showed you on the slide. If you go you. into the Yale Forum of Religion and Ecology, Yale Forum of Religion and Ecology, you'll see what they're doing. They're now doing things on a global level. They are, they are really kind of <laughs> missionaries for the cause, if you wish. And uh, you can find 
all the information on all uh, world religions on this website, including my own work. You can find an interview with me on their website and so forth. So, so do take a look at the Yale Forum of Religion and Ecology. As for your point about making it uh, well, better known, I don't know what else to do beyond what I'm doing, but it's kind of interesting that this conversation has been in the forefront of some people, at least since the mid nineties. And if you wanna go back in the, in the academic discourse since the 1970s, and yet we always remain unknown. So why is that the case? Why are people so unaware, uninformed, uninterested? Uh, I, I, I cannot explain it except um, that we need to do a better job and that's all I can do. I teach a course on it uh, at the university. I engage in a lot of public, I give a lot of public talks, but in the end, it's always those who are, I'm preaching to the converted. That's kind of the problem. I'm always teaching people who are already convinced rather than getting new people to, to realize. So all we can do is not to despair and to continue to teach. I'm an educator, that's, that's what I do for a living. So we need to just go at it. And at some point, by the time people will catch up, it's going to be too late. That's the problem. And, yeah, and, I agree. and if we can do something about it now, now is the time. So let me go to Betsy, who raised her hand. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, uh, I, I actually, my first simple question was, and maybe you answered it, does the Yale Forum have your lecture from, from the beginning of COVID with the um, Muslim and Christian theologian also? Is no, there a I way we can hear that? Yeah, no, I don't. That was a fascinating uh, event. I, I don't think so, but if you write me an email, I can find the uh, recorded lecture and, and, and share it with okay. you. Uh, you. It was done by an organization. Uh, it's it's a, a climate advocacy organization in uh, England, I think in Leeds. Oh, okay. I, Leeds or Manchester? I'm not sure. I don't remember now. And um, um, it it was really it's a faith based organization, and and that's kind of <laughs> my message. My message is that it's better to go through the religious. Yes, uh, dimension rather than the secular, because the secular conversation is not moving. You can show people endless diagrams. It's not going to move them one iota. But if you show them kind of uh, a, a biblical text that they can relate to emotionally or story that is based on the biblical narrative, you can move them a lot more or by the same token, based on the Quran or based on a Hindu text or Buddhist text. So so that's why I believe that religious environmentalism has more of a chance of shaping human kind of people's behavior and attitude than, than just science. You know, I've, right. been working, I've been working in this field um, for a, a, quite a while and have the last five or seven years tried to do it more from a Jewish lens where prior to that it wasn't. And the constant frustration is even people who know a little bit it's getting people to really engage and change their behavior and have action. And um, clearly you're, you're in sympathy to that. And you know, my question really partially is, um, and I kind of feel like I know your answer. It's like, do you have any like small nuggets of how to move that along? Um, because ultimately we know a lot and, and but knowing it isn't, unfortunately, isn't enough to, enough. Um, yeah. it isn't at all. And even some of the professional work I've done in the field and the research around what does it take to get people to change their behavior, not just about climate change. Um, and um, it's in, just incredibly frustrating. And it, the, is. it is. And I mean, you've been doing this work much longer than I have, but, um, it's, it's quite incredible. I mean, I've seen people literally with something in their hand to, to recycle and they look at a garbage can of, of garbage and recycling and they still go to the garbage can. And yeah. so um, it's... Um, yeah. yeah, I understand the frustration and uh, my answer would be, and that's because I'm an educator, but my answer is we have to start with a very young age. I would like to see all Jewish institutions, especially religious schools, doesn't matter which denomination you look, you see yourself, 
it has to start in schools and we have to treat uh, or to introduce youngsters. I come from a kibbutz in Israel. I was introduced to it really from day one. So I, I, I speak like a, like a, you know, from that perspective. Uh, you have to do it through education, teach children how to treat animals, how to be comfortable in the natural environment, how to see yourself as part of the natural world. So to me, again, the answer is the same. It's education. Unfortunately, we don't do too well educationally uh, speaking, and uh, I won't get into that. That's another long, long story. But uh, um, all Jewish institutions, civic, religious, whatever, should have that component built into what they're doing. That, that would be my answer. Of course, but the problem from what you said, which I'm aware of too, is that we don't have that much time left. Correct. So, right? And so, um, um, you know, we need to do, yes, absolutely what you're saying. And how do we activate more? Um, because so we, we have we very- need to, Yeah, we, we need to do it. The answer is always start with the leaders. Leaders have to change their, their knowledge and behavior and, 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 and uh, um, attitude. So training leaders, religious leaders would be a way to also kind of, it's, it's a top down, if you wish. I'm giving you both a top down and a bottom, bottom up, up approaches. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it has to be done now. I mean, in, in many ways, thank God we now have Biden and Biden really is committed to, to those ideas and, 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 and on a federal level, at least in the United States, uh, things can be done, but uh, you know, uh, you and I cannot work on that level. That's right. not the level right. we operate on. So right. I can only operate in a classroom, whether it's a Zoom class or regular class, it doesn't matter, but I only can do what I can do. Ms. Uh, Robert Bell has a, has a raised hand. Uh, just a couple of comments and a question. Uh, first, I come from without um, a Christian background. I really want to praise these lecture series. I, I promote them to all, all my friends. They're incredible. Um, I'm also involved in a vic promoting the victory garden model of gardening. I, you can probably see plants already started in my uh, window. Um, but I, our church has never been involved at approaching this from faith. And I think that's, you really nailed it. We've got to approach this from a faith perspective. And my question to you is what, so the Yale would be the best place to look for resources to promote it from a, you know, ecumenical faith perspective to get resources? Yes, absolutely. I would start with the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. Just Google it. It will come automatically. Oh, I, 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 I did while you were talking. <laughs> Good. And another organization, um, Green Faith, if you also go to Green Faith, yep. uh, just Google Green Faith, that's Fletcher Harper, and, uh, and, and you can uh, really get a lot of the uh, uh, resources there. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you, because of the internet, we now have access to so much stuff. You just put in religion and ecology, Google it in, you'll see how much information you yep. get. And your so, books cover this too? Your yeah, my, absolutely. My book, the last book that I wrote, which is based on three lectures on religion and science, my book, uh, Religion and Environment, uh, the case of Judaism covers the, the field and then it gives you three lectures, one on the ethics, the ethical dimension, environmental ethics, one is on philosophy and, nat and of nature, that's the center part of the book, and then uh, the, the kind of the activist or how it's related to science and religion. So it's available so, through Amazon? Yeah, it should be. It's Pandora. It's Pandora it's Press, which is a uh, small press in Canada. But I think uh, you should be able to get it done. If not, write me a note and I'll send you the sure. uh, the link. I I've been can taking notes. The... Yeah, sure, absolutely. You can. There's. I'm okay. telling you, there's no shortage of information. Uh, we are inundated with information. The people who are involved in this uh, interreligious conversation, they're wonderful people. Just. Yes. Fabulous people to be yep. with, and, well, and I really enjoyed your about the right thing. Yep. Yeah, I think you really hit all the right points. Very yeah. good lecture. Thank you. Good, thank you. I'm glad I can be of, of use to you. I was just going to say I really enjoyed your lecture also very much, and I very much agree with the solution is teaching in school in the school system from a very very early age, integrating the idea of ecology at all levels from from kindergarten upward all the way through, although it's going to take a while, but I think it's the only way is changing our mindset. Otherwise, we'll never change society. We'll never change our 
the environment. And that's so important. Yes, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I think that keep in mind that how, you see when a child treats a cat badly, that child is gonna treat another human being badly. So, so cruelty to animals, as an example, if a cat could be something else, cruelty to animals also translates into cruelty to people. So it's not that there is a conflict between quote unquote, the anthropocentric versus the biocentric. That was a big issue in environmental ethics in the 1970s. That's not the problem. To me, the bio and the anthro are integrated. So we always have to think in terms of socio-ecological approaches. It's always the social and the ecological together. Mm -hmm. And of course it has complexity in it. And of course you have some, sometimes you're gonna have conflicts between various uh, values or various uh, policies. Mm -hmm. It's not simple. I'm not saying that this is all hunky-dory, uh, but I'm saying that we have no choice but treating people to respect. There's a lot of lack of respect Toward the, toward, toward the soil, toward other people, toward the poor, toward uh, whatever it is, marginalized communities. It's about respect. How do we teach respect? And we have to start it from a very, very young age, I think. So, so I'm optimistic about the possibilities, but I also know the time is running out. Let's just keep on, the, on an optimistic note. Look at, um, what's her name? Our, our uh, Swedish girl, uh, uh, Greta. Greta. So Greta is a wonderful example of how a youngster, she's now whatever, 17, I don't think she's 18 yet, and mm -hmm. how this very young person can change a global conversation. It's, it's fascinating, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. But if she only remains a celebrity, then we got nothing done. It, we should move beyond celebrity to real work on the ground in organizations, in churches, in mosques, in synagogues, and so forth, uh, Hindu temples, you name it, we all need to work together and to learn from each other. And the fascinating program that I did in England, and I did a similar program in Berlin also, uh, when I was on the stage with a Muslim feminist, actually, and uh, the two of us are, you know, saying, hey, we, we, she's Muslim, I'm Jewish, and we realize how much we have in common. It was a moving, moving experience in the uh, Berlin Jewish Museum. I think it was uh, 2019 we did that program. So uh, a lot can happen. We just need to do it and we need to do it. Actually, Zoom helps us to spread the message, right? So, so this uh, COVID-19, which has enormous, uh, enormous impact, kind of uh, environmental dimension to it, um, you may want here is I'll give you another reference. There's something called the Berkeley Forum of uh, George Washington University. Berkeley Forum. If you just Google that, you'll see a list of people who, in the beginning of COVID, uh, were asked to write about COVID from an environmental perspective. And I'm one of them. And Mary Evelyn and her husband John are another um, contributor to to that series of us. Uh, uh, short, short statements. I think it was under 750 words, but uh, you will see that there are a lot of people interested in uh, religion and, and ecology or religion and environment. So you are not alone. That's all I can tell you. You are not alone. We just had to get together and, and, and work toward this very important goal. I think COVID has a great impact on how we are going to change. We know things have to change and they're going to change. And I think we're going to have a very big change. I think mo all of us to think about starting. One of the most important places to start is what we eat, because that is, takes up so much environmental space. And we have to make it to feel like a, it's a positive change, not a negative change, to change from a, to a plant-oriented food intake, not necessarily vegetarian, but a plant-oriented intake. And I've talked about this for many, many, many years and written about it. Absolutely. So I think it can happen but we have to give it a positive spin. Not, we're not taking away from anyone. We're giving people back something because you're healthier. And because there is a relationship between COVID and your nutritional intake, actually, those people who are in great health have a better immune system are more, get less effects from the COVID than the people who are in bad shape. The people who are overweight, the people who have nutrient deficiencies have, um, are more prone to the bad effects of COVID and they're getting it in the first place. Yes, and well, also this is we're in direction we can work in. Yes, yes I, I agree. I think it also to look at the if we begin to look at the world around us mm -hmm. as living, 
the soil is living. Yes. So if you think in those terms, uh, you are in an environment in which life, you are into life. So how do you protect life? It's not going to happen from technology and it's not going to happen for all sorts of synthet synthetic food as, as uh, <laughs> more cooked and understood already in 1958. It's going to come from the right kind of food and the right kind of soil and the right kind of commitment to the water, to, to the cleanliness of water and the purity of the air and so forth. So I think that uh, the direction is clear and I don't think that there's a lot of uh, disagreement about the direction. What we need is a will. There's a paucity or that's lack exactly. of will and lack of uh, commitment. And that's what we need to change. And technology is not gonna do it. In fact, technology often uses more energy we think, I always thought of solar panels, I thought of windmills, but when you think of the energy that goes into making these, it's unbelievable. And the more we consume and the more we do, the more environmental damage we're doing. It's, it's a matter of cutting back and consumerism and, and understanding that we don't need all these things. And we're a, right. a throwaway society. That's right. And we need to, one value, I, I've written recently on environmental virtue ethics, uh, for a, a new um, book that is going to come out next year on, on uh, virtue ethics. And there, you should just know that the virtuous simplicity, simplicity is a very important virtue. Many yeah. environmental uh, thinkers are, are, are uh, advocating to live simply. You don't have all the business, which I think with celebrity yeah. culture. What is this celebrity yeah. culture? It's nonsense, mm -hmm. absolute nonsense. Uh, but we are hooked into it and we try to, and our children try to imitate those celebrities and that caused a lot of this um, kind of uh, ex exhibitionist type of behavior which is very wasteful we can learn to live simpler and more down to earth really it's a kind of a down to earth judaism there's a beautiful book by that name uh, mm -hmm. by arthur <laughs> waskell down to earth judaism and that's exactly what it is. It's down to earth. So let's try to be more down to earth and care about all the inhabitants of the earth uh, because we depend on them and they depend on us. That's kind of the bottom line. And we can't be without each other. Any other questions or comment? I think you said it all. I think we, thing is we live in a throwaway society. Thank you, and think thank you all. Us. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you in our next event. Laila Tov from Jerusalem. All right, Laila Tov, and enjoy it and, and uh, live well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.